And you know. You're now listening to the legendary. The podcast that uplifts the DJ culture. And honors our legends. Vinyl Esquire with DJ Rick. You're now listening to the legendary. Vinyl Esquire. Vinyl Esquire. Vinyl Esquire. The podcast that uplifts the DJ culture and honors our legends. Vinyl Esquire with DJ Rip. Vinyl Esquire. Culture. Truth. Music. Vinyl Esquire. Hello, world. I want to welcome you to Vinyl Esquire, the podcast that delivers culture, truth, music. Would you join me, please, in welcoming DJ Rip? Hello, world. I want to welcome you to Vinyl Esquire. And Vinyl Esquire is the DJ podcast that uplifts the DJ culture and honors our legends. And my name is DJ Rip. And without further ado, I would like to introduce to Vinyl Esquire, the legendary DJ and the world-renowned international crate digger himself. I would like to introduce to Vinyl Esquire, DJ Supreme LaRock. Yes, sir. Track one, two. Yo, LaRock, how you doing, man? I'm good. How's things going? I'm hanging in there. You know, I ain't working seven months, but I'm hanging in there. Yeah, I know, man. It's, you know, it's challenging for everybody, but we all going to get through it. You know what I mean? So uh, I want to thank you for allowing me to interview you on Vinyl Esquire. Again, this is the DJ podcast that uplifts the DJ culture and honors our legends. So I want to go ahead and get right to the beginning. I'm going to go all the way back to where it all started for Supreme LaRock. So tell me who or what made you want to be a DJ? Uh, Red Alert. Red Alert was the first DJ I heard play, and that was, uh, I was in New York. You know, I'm from the West Coast, but as a youth, I was visiting New York. And so every night, you know, it started getting dusk, and, like, the whole block had their phone boxes. And then all, like, down the block and put on Kiss, and Red Alert would be on. So it was basically like a summertime block party. And, you know, that's when I heard Red Alert and I saw the reaction from the people in the street. That was like my first taste of DJ. And I didn't see him. I heard him. Right. The first the first DJ I saw that made me want to be like that was um, Easy Lee from The Treacherous Three. Because I ne- never saw a DJ cut up doubles and rock, you know, two copies of a record back to back. Got you. Okay. So what year and where was this at when you saw him? Oh, well, they came to Seattle. They um, they came out here for a show. And that was, man, I'm going to say 84, I think, around then. Got you, got you. So so what year did you start DJing? Here's the thing. So I, I was always dabbling, not DJing, but playing rec- getting records. I got a turntable when I was four years old. It was like my favorite thing my parents ever gave me. And I would... Uh, dig into their records for some reason they'd buy me records but i didn't like the records they were buying me i wanted to hear the funky shit so i dig into my pops collection it was like curtis mayfield james brown miles davis um you know things like that and i don't know why i was like always fascinated with records and uh so i was always buying them when i got my first allowance i asked my parents he take me to the record store and i bought a record and then of course, when I started b-boying, you know, when I when I discovered hip hop, started b-boying, I started buying uh, records to dance to. I'm buying breaks, and then probably started dabbling in DJing about '83, '82, '83. But like I said, wasn't like rocking doubles and cutting breaks back to back until I saw Easy Lee, and I was like, oh wow, like I was floored. I, I never saw something like that, so. I was like, I got to learn that. But I was dabbling before that. Got you. So would you credit Easy Lee, would you credit Easy Lee for your early influence of really wanting to become a DJ? Well, so that's another thing. I never really wanted to become a DJ. I wanted to do what he did. I wanted to learn what he did. But I never thought of being a DJ or becoming a DJ. It's kind of like something as a kid that you that I did that I never stopped doing. You know, eventually I turned into a DJ. I I never even put the word DJ on my name, even to this day. It's like other people call me that. I mean, I am a DJ, you know what I'm saying? But 
and then like aspire to be one. I just did. I just something I wanted to do, but not as a professional. Like I didn't know what I was going to do when I grew up. Right, right. DJ. I'm a DJ. Right. So, so what? What was your first name? What did you go by? Were you always Supreme La Rock? No, I was Danny D Rock. My name is Danny. So you know, back then everybody was like Rock or Ski. Right. Kind of like how I say a lot of. Uh, today, a lot of the rappers are little or young. So in our era, it was rap, I was um, ski or rock. So I was just D rock. You know, I took D for my name, Danny, and just D rock. Got you. So why don't you talk to me a little bit about you know those early years? You being from Seattle, what did the early hip hop scene look like in Seattle for you in those early '80s? And uh, and and then you becoming a DJ. Right. I mean, honestly, we didn't have a scene. It wasn't. It wasn't here yet. I was. I, I I don't want to say I brought it here, but I kind of did. Like, nobody was doing the shit. Okay. You know what I mean? Like, I saw it, and I witnessed it, and I wanted to learn it, and I was trying to tell my friends about it, my family, and I don't know, people weren't really hearing me out. And then, you know, breakdancing caught on, and it started getting real big, and, you know, it came out in flash dance, and people were seeing it in movies, and the phenomena hit. And when that hit, and like show graffiti rock came out, you know, people were seeing, oh, DJing, breaking, graffiti, all that, you know, the whole hip hop shit. Right. And right. so, you know, people started gravitating towards it. Like they, they were into it. It was a new culture. They liked it. And um, there were a couple people around town. Okay. For instance, like I was wearing, uh, I think Converse with like elastic in them because I saw Crazy Legs that rocked those on David Letterman. And I was like, oh, that's dope. You know, so I was rocking my shoes like that and nobody else in town. And then, like, I seen this cat downtown one day and he had them on. So it caught my eye. And I had to rap to him. I was like, yo, like, what's up with your style? We started talking and he happened to be from New York. So okay. the, the hip hop cats here in Seattle were transplants from the East Coast. And it was like, uh, we have military bases here. So there's a lot of military you know, from the East Coast, and that's pretty much who brought hip hop to Seattle. Got you. So you would say that you know you you're part of the foundation of, you know, what had become hip hop's or Seattle's hip hop scene, right? Because the the world got a taste of Seattle, you know, with with Nasty Ness, Nasty Mix Records, and Sir Mix a lot. So what does that mean right. to you? Uh, I mean, that's kind of difficult to question the answer. I mean, I love Mix, man. He's always done his thing. He's always been dope. Uh, we had our little beefs back in the day. Oh, okay. And, uh, I mean, it was nothing. You know, it was just, I guess, competitive hip-hop beef. Like, it was nothing. You know what I mean? When you look back at it. Right, right. I think that's the nature of hip-hop. Of course. It's competitive, right? You want to battle people. and Actually, that's how him and Ness met. Um, Mix called them out, and they battled. And, and Mix killed him. <laughs> wow. I wish I had it on video. And the funny thing about Mix, the era, kind of like Prince was real popular, right? It's kind of like Wrecking Crew when Dre had the make on and the like the, sat, the silky suit and all that. Right. So that era, like Mix kind of tried to be like that at first. He wanted to be like Prince and he was, he wasn't wearing makeup and he wear suits and stuff like that. And then I remember... I saw him, there was this public access channel that people would go on and he had on he had on like inside out jeans and a troop jacket and kazelles and, and a fat gold chain and I was just like, Damn, that ain't that ain't mix of style but I guess he was just trying to find his image or his style. You know, he was just trying to find what works for him. Right, right. Well the the reason why I'm asking you that is because again, you know, uh the hip hop world and us as DJs, you know what I mean? When when you know, I'm from the Midwest. Right. So the first time, you know, that that I even heard of Seattle, you know, was in 80, uh, 85, 86 when Sir mix came on the scene. Right. So, you know, with the early records. Right. So, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to let's paint the picture of uh, Supreme La Rock, the early Seattle hip hop scene, because, again, our picture comes from Sir mix who is a legend. And I've interviewed him before. And uh, he's put out a lot of classic records. And I know Ness as well. Cause, because aside from those two, you're the third person that I've ever talked to that's from Seattle. You know what I mean? Um, that, that, that has some type of hip-hop and DJ 
foundation. So I just wanted to paint the picture of what that early Seattle hip hop, you know, scene looked like through Supreme LaRock's eyes. Right. So there was another group that I don't know if you heard of them called the Emerald Street Boys. And they were the first rap group from Seattle. Okay. And they have a, they actually have a 12 inch out. It's, it's funny because it's been pretty easy to find and pretty cheap, but now it's people want it for some reason. It's going for dumb money. Gotcha. And of course you can't find it now. You know how it goes. Right. Absolutely. But uh, yeah, so they were doing their thing. Uh, Ness was always instrumental in, in DJing and being on the radio and doing parties and doing mixtapes. And then Mix em- emerged doing parties and then he started doing tapes and uh i mean you know that mix her to ness and i don't know why he called him out though he, he just like i said it's that competitive thing right and uh and and they battled and like i said mix see the thing with mix back then is like ness came with his two turntables and he like cut some records up mix some records and, and then mix came he have it brought us like 808 and a vocoder so he'd like stop DJing, but then the beat, the drum beat would kick in, and then he'd like rap with a, a robotic voice, and like the crowd would go nuts. He have like digital delays and reverbs and shit. Like he was doing shit nobody else was really doing. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? He was early on a lot of shit. Like he's always been an equipment head. He's always been into technology and equipment. Absolutely. So they were doing their thing. Emerald Street Boys were doing their thing. And uh, um, another thing is that WizKid lived out here nice so whiz kid okay. whiz kid was married his wife was in a group called sweet trio they were on tommy boy right she was there. remember i said there was a lot of uh like bases out here people would be stationed so his wife was stationed out here okay and then i met whiz kid and of course i think he's one of the greatest most underrated djs of all time absolutely i don't think people really understand how dope whiz kid was yeah he was incredible no question and then uh, I met him, you know, and I, I got to hang out with him. And so I get from him, and he was doing some parties around. And then later on, I don't know if you know, Ness signed him to Nasty Mix Records. Wiz Kid has a record on there. No, nah, I didn't know that. That's dope. And that, yeah, that came from him being from the town. Like, you know, here. Wow. Okay. But there was a lot of crew. There was um, AOC, Jam Pets was a DJ. Um, I can't remember, like, the names of all the crews. Right. But there was, like, a lot of DJ crews popping up. Some MCs, not a ton of MCs. More DJs than MCs. So why did you call yourself Supreme LaRock? How did you graduate from who you were at that time to to that particular name and why? Um, I had a home base from Carolina, and he was stationed out here. He was a hip-hop band. So he's another guy. I met mutual friends and... We see, and we kind of just similar. We just clicked, and uh, he DJed as well. So we we were like best friends. Actually, his name at the time was Barry Bass. I remember we were sitting at the house one day, and he said, "Oh, I don't like my name, Barry Bass. I'm going to change it." And he was like, he changed it to B Mellow that day. And then I was like, "Well, I might as well say, well, I got to change my name too." Said, well, well, what's the best of something? And I was like, Supreme, right? Like a Supreme pizza, whatever you can get. Is you know the best, right? Is supreme. So I, was, I wanted this her to be the best, right? You don't want to just be regular. So I'm like, oh, I'm gonna call myself Supreme. I added the La Rock because of Coke La Rock. I was like, I wanted to pay tribute to the cooker that is hip hop. How can I do that? Well, La Rock, like that's just a dope name. It flows, I like it. It's my way of thanking hip hop, paying tribute to our culture. Got you, got you. So what was your direction? Like, what was your, you know, so now you're a DJ, right? You call yourself Supreme LaRock. And, um, you know, you're inspired by, you know, Easy Lee. The, the, the hip-hop scene is now flourishing in Seattle. Looks like you're a part of it. And uh, so I'm, I'm assuming that this is mid-'80s now ar- around this time, right? Correct. And so, so now, you know, it, it's all morphing in and you're becoming your own. What was your direction? Like, what... How did you approach being a DJ? What type of DJ did you want to become? Well, it's funny because, like I told you, when I saw Easy Lee, like I just wanted to cut breaks. That's it. I just wanted to scratch and rock doubles of breaks and have rappers rap over them. So that was, and first, to me, that was, and that's what I wanted to do at that time. I mean, that's what I was doing at that point. Gotcha. You know, and I was getting good at it. 
I was getting good at it. Now, the thing is, I wasn't 21. I was still a teenager. And this nightclub, their DJ got got sick. He got the flu or something, and he couldn't work that night. It was like a Friday night, and they were scrambling to try to find a DJ. Well, pe- all these people told the club owner, oh, this dude, um, Danny D-Rock, he DJs. Even though I wasn't 21, he reached out to me, asked me to come play. I think he paid me like 200 bucks or something. And I was like, you know, I'm a kid. I'm ecstatic. Like, wow, I'm getting paid to do this. Right. So I went. I remember I went. I was cutting up like Bob James and shit and breaks. And, I mean, the crowd looked so disgusted. and People were leaving. Like, they didn't know what what I was doing or what was going on. I felt terrible. And then I realized, oh, DJing means you got to rock a party. Like, you got to read the crowd. You got to make them happy and, and play some shit they want to hear. You know saying? It's not all about me. Right, right. Absolutely. Right. And I didn't know. I was like, oh, I'm going to cut up breaks. They're going to lose their mind and go crazy the way I, I did when I saw it. Right. But nah, you know, they're the general public and they ain't hip hop heads. So I quickly learned at that point, well, DJing is much more than cutting up breaks and scratching. Absolutely. That's the eye opener and the turning point for me, what kind of DJ I want to be. And then I decided then, well, you know what? You got to be a, a well-rounded one. You got to be able to do all of it. So I would assume that at that point you decided to open up your mind and open up the vast collection and, and start DJing for you know multiple reasons, correct? Yeah. The funny thing is I didn't really, musically at that point, I didn't really open my mind. I opened my mind that point to, okay, I'm going to need to learn how to mix, you know, blend, put a set together that, that can rock a party. But with that being said, I still, my mind was pretty close musically. I only wanted to play rap or breaks. And it was like, um, <clears throat> this was a little few years down the line, but I played out with this other DJ. Now, also, if you remember back then, they only had one DJ in a club. Right, right. That was it, right? Like now they have a hundred DJs in a night or something. Like it's crazy. So back then, this uh, they had two. They put, put me with somebody else, and I kind of watched how he played, and he was so whack to me, mm. like he was trash. But he rocked the party, and the crowd loved him. And I was like, oh, man, really? They like they they like they like trash like this? Like I was confused. But I realized, oh, he's playing the songs they want to hear. Right, like songs on the radio or popular records, right? right? Exactly, exactly. Right. And I'm not trying to do that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But I realized if I want to make a living DJing and play in these clubs, I'm going to have to do that. But cash, you know, cash money taught me early on, do it, but do it your way. Still rock doubles, still cut it up, still make it fresh. Right, Still right. Make it funky. And so that's when I opened my mind. That's when I'm like, oh, yeah. And then, um, you know, once I did that, like, it was it was like a, a new coming or a new day. Like, it was dope. Like, I like I dove in and I found some music. So when you say the cash money, did he teach you? Did you see him do it? Was it just an inspiration? What was that no, connection? No, we talked. I was, I, I, so I used to go to the New Music Seminar DJ battles every year every summer in, in uh, New York. Got you. Okay. And so I met Cash, I don't know, probably late 80s. Yeah, like late 80s. But we just talked, you know, we just talked about DJing. And I remember, he, you know, he said that to me, they're stuck with me. He's like, no, you can still play that stuff, but, you, but play it your way. You know, still make it funky. And then I was like, yo, yeah, he's right. Yeah, that that's Cash's thing. Just make it funky, right? You know? Absolutely. So, okay. I try to tell people about hip hop because I'm trying to tell people hip hop is all music. It's not rap. Like it's all, it's rock. It's breaks. It's there's funky country. Like it's it's all music. It's the way you rock it. Absolutely, absolutely. So, how would you how would you describe your style as a DJ or you know as a selector? You know, would you say you know it's more on the collector side? Is it more turntablist? Is it a club DJ, or would you just say that you're all the above? Uh, I'd like to say I'm I'm well rounded. You know, I'm a little bit of all of that. Gotcha. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a master at scratching, but I can scratch. I'm not a master at juggling, but I can juggle. 
Gotcha. You know, I'm not I'm not Cubert on the turntable. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. But I can rock, and I'm nice with mine. You know, like I'm not a slouch. That's for sure. <laughs> No doubt, no doubt. But you know, we're rocking in clubs. I mean, I've played in clubs for 30 years now. Got you, got you. So what would you say would be some of your contributions to hip-hop and the DJ culture coming from Seattle? Uh, well, one of the main ones is uh, the company Rain used to be based here. And so, you know, early on, with it's funny, because early on with them, I went up there and I tried to convince them to put a hamster switch in a mixer. Mm. Right. Because I'm, I'm hamster style. And the reason for that is nobody taught me nothing. When I came up, we didn't have YouTube. I didn't have a mentor. I couldn't go on the internet and Google something. I didn't even know like about Techniques 1200s. I went and I found whatever turntables were in our house and I put them together. I was like, I'm going to DJ with these. Right. Of course, they were pieces of crap. And... What I didn't know, so I went I got this cheap mixer from Radio Shack, and what I didn't realize is that I plugged them in wrong, so they were backwards. Mm, yes. I didn't know better, so that's how I taught myself. And then I remember a, another DJ that came by, we were going to practice, and he said, what's up with your shit? It's broken. It's not working. I'm like, what are you talking about? He said, it's going the wrong way. And I was confused. Like, what are you talking about? I said, well, that's the way I do it. And he was really confused. Come to find out, Years later, a lot of DJs do, did that. A lot of DJs are hamster style. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them have a similar story. But so I went to Rain because I thought, so here's the deal. Like when we used to DJ, do, do parties out, I'd have to switch the turntables around to DJ hamster style. Mm -hmm. So when there's another DJ rocking before me that's regular, how do I switch them around during a party? Right, right. Right. So it's like, we need a switch on the mixer where you can push a button and it can go either way. Absolutely. What I used to do in the party, this is hilarious. What I used to do is when I come on, I'd unplug like the white RCA out of both sides. Uh -huh. I'd switch them around. I'd switch them around. Believe and them. then I'd do the red ones. So uh -huh. I'd, do them one at a, I'd do them one at a time so the sound never cut out. And nobody ever knew I switched it. Right, 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 right. So I went to Rain. I told them about that. I met with them and told them about that. I think they thought I was losing my mind or I was nuts. Like they weren't trying to hear nothing. <laughs> they weren't trying to hear me at all. I think it was a good 12 years later that they came out with a hamster switch. Wow. Wow. But it was, but I, I was on that early trying to tell them. But so after that, um, you know, we, we created a relationship. They sponsored me. I was a rain endorsed DJ and I'd go there all the time. So I would help with mixers. You know, I'd say, Oh, it needs this kind of fader or the fader should be adjustable. And I'd give them input on the mixers. So you, you've been doing that for years. Uh, that was probably, yeah. Like in the nine, early nineties, early nineties. Yeah. Up until they're not around anymore. Cause Newmark bought them out. Right. Absolutely. And all the guys I know, I mean, they're closed down, but all the guys were retiring. They were, a lot of them were getting older and retiring. Wow, that's interesting. That's dope. That's dope. So, Supreme, I understand you're a collector of all things culturally related, right? Toys, <laughs> vinyl, hip-hop collectibles, you know, etc. Talk to me about, talk to me first about your vinyl collection. How many records would you say that you have, first off, and, um, you know, what would you say are some of your most prized possessions, some of the most valuable records that you know that you have that are incredible and they're hard to get? And I'm, I'm bringing this up because I think internationally you're known uh, as a crate digger, a, a, as a record collector, right? So, right. So, so talk to me about, first, your vinyl collection. Talk to me about your vinyl collection. All right, so like I said, when I was young, I got into records. And I always questioned, like, why? Why did I, like, what drew me to records? Right. And I remember, um, like, four or five years old, and my family would leave me with my cousin who, to babysit me, and he was in the records. So we'd sit there, and he'd play records all day. And I think that had a lot to do with it. Like, that was an influence for sure. And so I was always buying records. One day I came home, you know, I still live with my parents in high school. I couldn't even, I couldn't walk into my room. 
because it was full of records. It's funny because I actually sold most of them that day. I was like, this is stupid. And I got rid of them, but I always regretted it. Right, right. But, uh, you know, I've always been buying records. When that Village Voice came out with, uh, like, the top 100 break beats, I went out and bought it. I was like, oh, I got to get all of these. Right. You know, I was learning. I was doing the knowledge and learning. And then I'd um, say something like the Funk Incorporated Cool is back, right? So say I'm looking for that break. Right. And I'm out digging, and I can't find the shit. Like, I cannot find it. But I would find all their other albums. And I just leave them there because I was like, that's not, the songs are not on there. I don't want that one. The song's not on there. And just like, you know, when I got open to music to playing different kind of music, one day I thought, well, wait a minute. If Cool is back, is funky. Maybe they have another funky song. Right. Right? They only recorded one funky song? Nah. They got, they got four albums out. All of them might be good. Yeah. Right? So then I started picking those up. Initially, so initially early on, I to the break beats. He, he gave me the octopus break, like when they came out. Who, who, who was that again? Louie Lou. Yes, sir. Okay, go ahead. T the Rock, T the Rock's DJ. Absolutely. So he hit me to the octopus breaks. And then from then on, I wanted to find the original records. Right. So I'm like, oh, assembly line, Commodores. All right, so I'll go out and find that. And then I was just going to collect the original breaks that are on those compilations. Right. But I said, you start looking at other shit, like finding other breaks. Yeah. And even back then, like I'd go into the soul section, you know, this was like, this was like I said, late eighties, but I'd only go, when I hit a store, I'd only go to the soul section. Right. Right. This sounds so much like me. Go ahead. I did this. I wasn't looking at anything else. Right. Only soul music, only funk. And one day, this cat was coming out the shop as I was coming in, and he had an incredible bongo band under his arm. And I say, yo, where the, where was that at? Right. And he said, in the rock records. I said, rock? That's a rock? I thought, that's a rock record? And so that day, I went through the rock records. I found a lot of shit. Yeah. And then I realized, man, some of these people that I work here are just dumb. They don't know what a record is. They just put it anywhere. Mm-hmm. They don't know what section to file it in. And so I started going through rock. And then I thought about jazz. I'm like, let me look at the jazz. I started finding shit in the jazz section. And then, like, some, um, I met some Japanese guys. They had came overseas to do a record buy for a shop. And uh, they hooked up with me. You know, they heard I was due with some records. So we went out, we went out shopping, digging. And, like, I thought I was thorough, but these dudes, I mean, they cleaned out the store head to toe, front to back. Wow. And they were finding, they were finding shit in, like, the classical section or country. And I'm like, what the hell? And so at that point, I realized I got to go through the whole spot. The whole store, right? You can't leave no rock unturned. Because I also realized at that point, Cats was coming in. Other DJs, you know, they was low on money. They'd pick out all the dope shit and then, like, try to hide it. Like, try to stash it yep. in the classical. They're like, no one's going to look in the classical. We'll stash it here and come back next week and get them. Right, right. I could always tell, like, oh, somebody stashed this shit. <laughs> like, you could find a pile and you knew somebody had cherry-picked and, and put that shit aside. Yes, yes. What's, what's interesting? But as far as, like... As far as, like, grails and stuff, I mean, I've always just been buying stuff. Like, that's the thing, man. That's the thing. Like, a lot of these cats or collectors or DJs can't believe I'll I'll have something. And, like, I try to tell everybody, like, everything was made on, everything came out on a record. It might have been promo only. It might have been a test pressing. Right. It might have been an tape. Like, we didn't have MP3s. We couldn't just email the song to the DJ. They had to actually press it and send it out. Correct. And see if it caught a buzz or if anyone liked it. And if it didn't, it was dead at that point. They didn't press anymore. Right. But they were out there, right? They were made. A lot of them might have got thrown in the trash. A lot of DJs might have took them home and just put them on a shelf. Right, absolutely. 
things are rare, but they're out there. Everything, everything was pressed. And another thing I tell everybody, as well, I was just talking about this yesterday. Because I was in the shop and Deuce said, man, I can't believe this is a $500 album, this shit. And I say, all records were a dollar at one point. All of them, no matter what they were. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, at some point in, in life, they were a dollar. Absolutely. You'll buy a record right now. Another thing, another thing, since I was early or digging early, I don't really feel like I was early. I was just doing what I do. Yeah. But I was catching, I was catching things cheap because no one was looking for them. Nobody cared. Right, right. So when, uh, so when you went to go dig, were you looking for 45? I not, now, I know you said you were looking for certain things, certain genres at one time, but then you opened up and started looking for everything. But did you make it a point to pick up 45s versus 12 inches versus full length, or were you just grabbing it all? Okay, so not 45s. For some reason, I hated them. I didn't have patience enough. They were hard to go through. Right. Yeah. I, was like, I don't have the patience. It's already hard to look through everything else. I would spend hours looking at these things. Like I didn't have the patience, and I didn't like them. They were hard to DJ with. Yes, absolutely. You know, like if you find, I don't know if you've ever find them or seen them, cats used to glue 45s to a 12-inch. Yep. So they could cut them up. Yeah. Anyways, uh, it was same thing, probably like late, like 89-ish probably. I was at a record show, and I'm, I went up to this box to go through it, and this dude like beat me by one second. He got he stood in front of me and he's digging through the box. And like when I dig, I'm so used to it. I go quick through a box. And this dude is going so slow. And I'm sitting there real impatient, like about to lose my mind, like hurry the fuck up. Right. So as he's as he's digging, there was a box of forty fives next to it. So I just said, I'll just to waste time, I'll just look through these. And so maybe like the second record in, I pulled one out and it said, um, it said, Bold Soul Brother, Bold Soul Sister. And I was like, oh, that sounds like it could be funky. Right. And then not only that, the label said Seattle on it. I'm like, oh, this shit is from Seattle. Mm. And I had my portable. So I put it on and it was, it was funky as fuck. And it blew my mind. It, had, it started with a drum break. Nice. And I was like, oh, and then that, and then that's when I was like, shit, I gotta look, I gotta look through forty fives now. Right, right, right. Because not only did I find something funky, unknown, with a break, it was also from my own city. And just like I say with the funky, well, if they made one album, who's not to say the other ones ain't funky? Right, right. So I'm like, oh, does this group have any other records? Oh, is there any other Seattle funky shit? And then I learned. A lot of the 45s had the instrumental version on the backside. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way you could get it. Yeah. And then I learned some of them have breaks on them that ain't on the album. Right. And then vice versa. Some album cuts have yeah. the break and the 45 doesn't. It's, it's, right. Yeah. It's crazy, it's, right? Right. It's a crapshoot. You just you end up having to buy it all to really have it all, right? And then I learned, you know, the collectibles label? It was a reissue label? Correct. So, well, then I learned with them, some of the songs they put out weren't even the original artists. They had a band go in and redo the song. So it's a whole different version. Yes, yes. I have so many of or, those. Or they um, got the masters somehow and remixed, like, did the mix over and the drums are chunkier or the drum break's different. Right, right. So it's like endless. When it comes to records, like, this shit literally never ends. So how many records would you say roughly that you have? I stopped counting at 50,000, and that was years ago. Wow. But the thing is, I sell it, I sell in trade. So, you know, honestly, I'm running out of space in the crib. So, you know, usually nowadays if I'm getting something, something's leaving. Like I'm getting rid of something and bringing something new in. Gotcha. I didn't know you sell in trade vinyl too. Okay, that's dope. I mean, it's not, I'm not a dealer, but, you know, Sometimes, you know, if somebody comes by or they know I got something and they'll offer me a ridiculous amount, yeah, you can have it. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. So, again, like I said, you know, internationally you're known and, uh, and, and, you know, and in America, obviously, you're known to be a collector, right, and a crate digger. But you also collect right. things other than vinyl, right? 
So you collect yes. a- action figures, you know, just hip hop collectibles and, you know, and everything pop culture related. Talk to me about a few of your, cause I know, you know, recently me and you have had a conversation about uh, an ESG action figure that you obtained, which is incredible. And, um, right. you know, and again, ESG, the group from the Bronx, the female funk band had the UFO break, the famous, you know, UFO break. And uh, this is an action figure made off of the group, one of the group members. Talk to me about some of the some of the non-vinyl collectibles that you have. Right. But before we do that, though, I want to tell you a little story because so I had a label. I had my own label called Conception Records. Okay. In the 90s. And that was distributed through Sub Pop. And so I remember when I was in their offices signing the deal, they gave me a bunch of records, you know, from their label. And I just, I was, it was like rock records and stuff, stuff I wasn't really into, but I took them, I brought them home, I put them on the shelf. And then years later, I'm going through them and there was a cover of UFO. So there's another version of UFO out there that's from Seattle. Mm, okay. And a lot of people, a lot of people don't, don't know about it. Wow. But I, Glad I'd bring that up since we're talking about ESG and UFO. Absolutely. So that's something to check for. Absolutely. And and, and but yeah. So um, I mean, when we spoke briefly the other day, I was telling you I've never ever considered myself a collector. Just like I don't. I, I mean, I'm a DJ, but I didn't set out to be a DJ. Like I didn't set out to be a collector. Right. But I'd see, you know, if I see something dope, I'm at, I'm at it. It's it's coming home with me. And I've always been that way since I was a kid. I just always hustled away to, to figure out how to get something, whether it's saving my lunch money all week or whatever it is. And so, you know, I, I've seen shit over the years. Like, I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm always out digging for records. And when I'm out digging for records, I come across other things or I buy, you know, sneakers that I like. Absolutely. And just like how I said, oh, I came home, I couldn't walk in the room, my record, my room was full of records. I couldn't open the door. Right, Well, it right. eventually got like that with sneakers. Like, I came home one day, and I'm like, this is shit is ridiculous. Why do I have 500 pairs of sneakers? Mm-hmm. I don't even wear them. <laughs> right. That's the thing. Like, I like them so much, I don't even want to wear them because they're so fresh. I'm like, I don't want them to crease or get dirty. Yeah, you just want to stare at them, right? Right. But then I'm like, that's kind of dumb. Like, why do I have them? Like, you want to rock them. You want to be right. fresh. Right, and when right. when you don't rock them, they turn yellow and they, the soles peel off when, you know, it's crazy. Absolutely. Absolutely. But, yeah, so that figure, uh, someone had put it up on Instagram. I don't even know how. I, somebody I wasn't following. I think I was, it was just in the feed. You know how you go to the homepage or something? It shows a bunch of different stuff. Right, Absolutely. Right, I just was like scrolling and I saw this ESG figure and I lost my mind like, oh shit. And then I, I hit him up. I was like, um, are these for sale? And it was like, yeah, you can buy it. And I was like, yeah, I'll take one. And so I got it and I, little did I know it was a custom one-off joint and the person that makes them only makes one. of Whatever they do, they only make one. Right. It's one of one. It's dope. Right. So then I posted it, and the people was going crazy, and everyone's hitting me up. Like, where do I get it? How do I get it? I'm like, oh, hit this person up. Right. And they're hitting me. They won't sell me one. They said they only made one. And I'm like, huh? I hit them up. They're like, yeah, you got the only one. And I'm like, oh, shit. (laughs) Okay. Right. Well, that's how I found out about it is because I seen it. Because, again, just like you, you know, I've been a DJ since the early 80s, and I collect vinyl. I collect everything hip hop and culturally related. And I saw the ESG action figure and was like, Oh shit, I got to have that. You know what I mean? And, uh, right. I, hit, I hit them up. They said, yeah, we only made one. We don't sell it. And, uh, we sold the one that we made. And then I looked at your profile cause I knew I was going to be interviewing you soon. And I was like, yo, he's the one who bought that damn thing. And then when I talked yeah. to you, you was like, yeah, I'm the one who got, it. I'm like, damn man. You know what I mean? So it was kind of like that right. same that same feeling of when you walk into a record store, you're looking for something or you might not be looking for it. And the next man grabs it before you and you're like, damn, you know what I mean? You know, yeah, that's terrible. 
That's an awful feeling. <laughs> and, and what's funny is, is that you were talking about people stashing things or leaving things behind. I remember I was in a record store in Maryland and I was digging through the crates, you know what I mean, and grabbing breaks and 45s and the whole nine. And I saw a, a small box behind the counter and I could see one of the first records and I was like, that's what I'm looking for. And the guy behind the counter said, nah, I can't sell you these. I'm holding these for Biz Markie. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, I know Biz is a collector too. So I know everything back there is fire. You know what I mean? Of course. So anyways, it was, you know, again, I could completely relate to the stories that you're talking about. So, so that's incredible, man. So salute to you for always just collecting vinyl and respecting the culture of a DJ and, you know, and, and hip hop, you know what I mean? So, right. so let's talk about some music. Talk to me about any things, you know, in your career that you've produced, you know, or that you have put out on your own label, you know, like you had said before. Right. Okay. So my first record, I believe came out in 87 and that's um, by the Incredit crew on Gemini records. And that was my own label. I was graduating high school. And I remember my parents, they wanted to do something for me for graduation. I know most kids was getting cars and all this shit. And I said, I want to put a record out. And they said, okay, well, we'll help you put a record out. So that was my first record. And that was, you know, what I got for graduating high school. And wow. what I remember about the record is, it was probably like, by the time we had made it and sent it off to be pressed, it was like four months or something before it was going to be the new year. And I put the new year on the label. Because I'm like, well, it won't actually be out until next year. So as far as the copyright, I remember putting an extra year on it. So it was actually the year before that that it came out. Mm, okay. But that was the first thing I did. It was like little things like, okay, so little things along the way. Like I wanted, my dream was to make a record. And then I did that. And then I'm like, okay, uh, what else do I want to do? Well, I wanted to see my record for sale in the store, right? I'm like, I want to go to a store and see my record, you know, next to EPMD or Rob Bass or whatever it is. And then I got distribution and we got that off. So I was like these little victories. Okay, what, what's next? Oh, I want to be on MTV. And then, I don't know, they had caught wind of, wind of it somehow. And we did this interview and it, it aired on MTV News. So it was just like little victories of things I wanted to do, right? I never wanted to be like a huge star or have a million dollars. Like I never looked at it like, okay. I think I always respected the culture and just wanted, wanted to do it, you know, do what I do. But, uh, so that was the first record we did or that I did. And then, uh, we got a deal after that. I had to sign this deal with a label called Enigma. Yes. I remember that label. Okay. Right, they had some huge rock records out. Right. They were big. Like, I think they were through Capitol. Mm -hmm. so I did this deal with them for two albums, and we recorded, I produced two albums, and turned them in, and it just, nothing ever happened. Like, it just folded. I really never knew what happened. Mm, okay. I just thought, to me, I thought I was, because I was probably two weeks late on the deadline we had a deadline date to turn in the masters and I was two weeks late. So I figured, Oh, I was late. They're basically like, forget you. We're not messing with you. That's how I looked at it. So at that point, it kind of shattered my dreams of being in the rap game, of being, being in hip hop, being an artist, right? right? You're right. Being an artist, a commercial artist, not necessarily like a huge successful star, but a commercial artist. Right. Right. And so, that plan is like, uh, I'm just going to go get a regular job, be an average Joe. Like I gave it, I gave it my shot. It didn't work. And so I went and got a job and I wasn't, I wouldn't say I was depressed, but I wasn't happy with life. You know what I mean? I'm like working this crappy job. And I remember I went out, the main source album came out and I got that. And when I heard it, it sparked me. Was, I got to call large and tell him he sparked me. When I heard that shit, I was like, oh, no, I got I to gotta do this. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. Like, that album was so incredible to me, the production. Right. So here's more inspiration and motivation to do something else. Right. right. Now right. you're talking about Large Professor and Main Source. Right. Go ahead. Right. So I, get, so I dive back into it. And then I got a deal really soon after that with a, a label called Ubiquity out of California. Okay, I remember that label as well. 
yeah, they were starting a label and they were looking for stuff and this cat I had met, Sure Shot, DJ Sure Shot, he was buying records from them because they had a record store called Groove Merchant. So he had a relationship with them. He said, Oh, I just found this cat that produces and I sent him a like I sent him a beat or something and they were they like, Yeah, they signed me immediately. So I started doing stuff with them. And then I started licensing things to various labels. Mm, okay. I got shit out major labels overseas, like Columbia, um, Eight Ball Records, uh, Shadow Instinct, a, a bunch of labels. And then from then on, I was like started my own label. That was Conception Records, and that was uh, me, Sure Shot, and this cat named Straff. I don't know if you're familiar with any of that stuff. Yes, I have heard of those labels. Yes, they're like. Uh, I mean, one of my favorite records we put out was The Grassroots out of Toronto, Canada. Amazing album. I think it's heavily slept on. It's uh, it's rare. It goes for dough these days. That's another thing. A lot of the records I did, if you look them up, they're going for crazy dough. Right, right, right. And it's like, um, like me and Finesse was talking. He's like, that's the. He's like, that's not an accident. That's not by accident that the records are sought after and they're going for money. Right. You know what I'm saying? And fin- Lord Finesse again, another another creator, another collector, another dope producer. Yeah, that's my brother right there. Like, I cat, you know, I cat is amazing. Absolutely. So, what were you using for production at the time? What equipment were you using? SB twelve hundred. Because when I got my first deal with Enigma, as part of the deal, I made them buy me an SB twelve hundred. They were like, "Well, what do you want?" I said, "I need an SB twelve hundred." Well, it's and they smart. It for me. Do you still and have I it? I still have it. Yes, sir. I still have it. I never. I will never get rid of that thing. <laughs> right, right. And again, those are going for a lot of dough right now. Yeah, crazy dough. But I have got rid of. Uh, there was a time I had a, a, a Mint eight hundred eight, a nine hundred nine, a, a Roland SVC vocoder. Mm-hmm. I had all this shit in my studio, and it was sitting, and I wasn't using it. Right. And I, and I got rid of that stuff. I'm like, well, man, am I really going to use this? I'm like, I haven't turned this 808 on in, you know, months. And I let them off. And I always regret it. Yes. And I thought to myself when I let it off, well, if I need one, I'll just buy another one. But now you know how much those are going for. Oh, yeah. The, the three or four times, right? five times the yeah. amount that they ever went for. Absolutely. Right. Right. So that's another regret I have was letting those off. Right, right. I remember, though, I remember with the SP, I was like, no, I, can't, I will never get rid of this thing. Yeah. Cause anyway, it, so I was using that, and then uh, I got an Akai S950, the rack mount to go with it. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, that was the dream setup for 90s hip-hop. Absolutely. I mean, it's, I don't know if you would say it's a dream setup now, but it's its what every collector wants right now. Right. I know. The SP12 and the SP1200 with the rack mount, so they could just sound like they made '90s hip hop today. You know what I mean? Right, right. It's incredible. That's incredible. So, what do you prefer to use? I mean, what do you use now? You know what I mean? Production and DJ wise. What What's your tools of trade now? Well, so that's a funny thing too with Serato. So one of my one of my friends out here, he was the first one of the first people to have Serato, and the day he got it. He called me. He was ecstatic. He was like, "You gotta come by. You gotta see this." He's like, "You're gonna, you're gonna be floored." So I went over there and he showed it to me, and I said, "That's the dumbest thing I've ever seen." <laughs> mm-hmm. I was like, "You want me to play record? You want me to play off of a computer?" Right. I was like, "That looks. That even looks ridiculous." Are you standing there staring at a computer? You supposed to be DJing? I was like, "Nah, that's not for me." I was like, maybe it's for you or, or other cats. That's not for me. And I stayed away from it as long as I possibly could. Sounds like so many of us. Go ahead. Right. And I was touring. I was a touring DJ at that time. Like I was going around the world playing clubs. And the airlines started making a lot of changes. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. You know, then you could only bring on one bag. And then you had to pay for an extra bag and I had to pay extra because it was heavy right and I'm taking three to six crate three to six ATA cases full of records with me and I came back from Los Angeles 
and that cost me like six hundred fifty dollars or something to check my records to come home, right? Because I had so many extra bags and it was heavy, right? And I was like, I can't be doing this. This cost. I mean, my ticket was like ninety nine dollars to come home, right? And I'm paying six fifty to bring my records back. Yeah, something's got to change, right? And so. I remember when I landed at the airport and I got in the car and I drove straight to Guitar Center. And I said, give me that, that damn Serato. Yeah. Because I know if I'm going to be traveling, this is what I'm going to have to do. Absolutely. So, and so, that's why I got That's why I ended up getting it. I didn't end up getting it because I wanted to or because everyone was doing it. That's the new thing. That's how we do it now. I got it because I had to. I thought I was going to be traveling, and I couldn't be paying those fees like that. Right, right, right. And eventually, you know, I ended up liking it. I'm going to be honest. I like it and hate it equally, probably. Yeah, well, I think we all do. All of us, you know, that come from the vinyl, you know, the turntable, you know, you graduate to the 1200s because that's, your, you know, the end-all, be-all, you know, <laughs> turntable. And, you know, and then here comes Serato, which eliminates all of the carrying of the vinyl. But we don't want to give away how that vinyl feels and that whole concept. So we fight it for years and fight it for years, and then we give in, right? And then some cats right. have done what I can't believe they've done, and they sell all their records because now they're digital DJs because they use a Serato, right? So, you know, I, I, I completely understand that whole fight. We all have went through it as DJs, you know what I mean? But, you know, you can't, you can't exclude the fact that now you don't have to carry all these records, you know what I mean? Right. So funny because when that happened, like a lot of my homies are, like you said, they're the collection. And I go over there and say, hey, man, where's your records at? Oh, I sold them. I was like, you didn't call me? Right. You sold them and you didn't call me? And they're like, well, you have everything. I'm like, that doesn't matter. Right. It doesn't. You know, certain records, there's certain records to this day I'm always going to buy. Every copy I see, is, I'm going to buy it. Right, I mean, it's not just that way. Not it's in my blood, it's just that way. Right, not everybody has everything ever made, and then right, of course, and and then you want doubles or maybe triples, or maybe you want right. to stack some up, you know, put some on ice, play some, or maybe resell them. Who knows? You know what I mean? I mean, and if there's something dope, you know, you might be looking for something. I say, I got you. I got five of those. You can have one. Right, absolutely. You know, I, I hook my peoples up. Absolutely. Anyway, so cats, everyone was selling their shit. No one was calling me. But at the same time, I was finding a lot of shit at that time because it was popping up. Mm. People were getting rid of their shit. Right, right. And like how I got rid of my, my drum machines, all my people, oh, I shouldn't have sold my records. I can't believe I sold my records. I shouldn't have never did that. Right. Yeah, well, you did. Right. It's it, it's the story. It's so I've heard this story just a hundred times, man, but... Right. So, 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 you know, Supreme LaRock, I mean, it, it's an incredible journey to, you know, to talk to you about, you know, your start, you know, in Seattle, you know, as a young guy, you know, getting an inspiration to want to be a DJ, becoming a DJ, and then becoming a collector of vinyl and everything culturally related. I mean, we're DJs, so it seems like we are always collecting or buying something, right? So, you know, it, yeah. it, it, so it's incredible to hear the story. And to hear it from somebody coming from Seattle, because again, you know, um, salute to Mix a Lot and Nasty Ness, but that's what the world knows of Seattle. So, is there any um, backstories or anything, you know, from Seattle that people might not just know about that you feel is worthy? You know, hip hop notables or 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 you know, just funk bands or anything. You know what I mean? Just some type of Seattle music history. Yeah, the crazy. So you know, there was a crazy funk scene here. And that goes back to that I told you I found. Right. Where it had a Seattle address on the label. And it was the dopest shit. And I'm like, what is this? And then so when I dove into that, I started finding a lot of Seattle funk and soul stuff. But I was like, really? Like, I had no idea. And then later on, I put a comp together called Weedle's Groove on Mike Neatic Records. So I did that comp. I did a part two. I did a 45 box set. And there's a documentary out. You can see the clips on YouTube. I don't think the full doc is on YouTube. Mm, okay. I know it might be on Netflix. I know it was on something because people been hitting me up because they, oh, we saw you on TV. And then uh, 
So check out the Doc Weedles Groove. That's all about the Seattle funk and soul scene. It's called Needles Groove? Weedles. So the Weedle was basically like a like a big bear. Mm. And he's a fictional he's a fictional character from Seattle, but he was the mascot for the Sonics basketball team. Right. Okay, got you. Weedles Groove. So it's called okay. Weedles Groove because one of the records I found is called Weedles Groove. And it's a, uh, it's just like this funky instrumental. Nice. So I guess he used to, I guess the mascot would come out and dance to that song at basketball games or something. Wow, wow, that's incredible, that's incredible. And 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 I got so there's that. Uh, B Boy Fever One from Rocksteady Crew was from Seattle, and we were a crew when we were younger. Wow, that's incredible. I and and, and I have to salute you, you know, because again, we're talking about breaks, we're talking about history. Most recently, I got a you know a, a mix from you, and I put it up on the Vinyl West Choir app, um, and sold this interview. But uh, you know, I thought the mix was incredible, man, because it was it was a great beat break mix, right? But what I noticed about the mix was there was a lot of versions that I had never heard of before of you know popular breaks. You know what I mean? Right. You know, right. so I'm assuming that, you know, you, I don't want to say specialize in, but, but uh, you, I'm assuming that because where you're from and how you've collected over the years, you got a lot of obscure versions of, of popular records that people just might not have. Is that correct? Most definitely. And I also, I got to attribute that also to that I've been lucky enough to travel the world. Right. And, and you know, as a DJ, like I go to other countries. And so when I'm there, you know, I'm always, like I said, I'm always looking for something. <laughs> right, right. You know, whether it's toys or games or funky clothes. Or, and so when I'm digging for records, I'll ask them. Like if I'm in Mexico, you know, I'll ask them, was there like a, did you guys have like a, a version of a, a guy that thought he was James Brown or something? Like, you know, I'll ask them that. Right, right. And then do you have you, anything like funky you, or did these guys try to do this? And, and then, you know, I, like you said, I'll find crazy versions. Yes. Like, I, it's ridiculous. Like, wow, this is ridiculous. Absolutely. I remember I was on a, because I road manage and do a lot of brand managements for Flash. And I remember I was in uh, Mexico with Flash and uh, I went to a record store and I found a, a lat, well, not, it, it was like a Mexican pressing of a James Brown 45, but it wasn't James Brown. It was a Mexican band that redid Funky President, and it was incredible. Right. I was like, oh, man, this is dope. You know <laughs> what I mean? So absolutely, I'm right there with you. I can relate, no doubt. So Supreme LaRock, what projects are you currently working on? Well, I have a record coming out on Record Store Day, which is in two weeks from now, I believe, and that's uh, the with Nerdy B and Shelly Chill. And that was one of the original records that uh, one of the albums that was supposed to come out on Enigma. So during the COVID lockdown, this cat was like cleaning out his studio or something, and he found the real tapes, the masters. Wow, okay. And he saw my name on them. And he hit me up like, yo, what's up with this? What? He's like, I've seen your name on this. And so he, he contacted me. And then they came from the guy that originally owned the label that had to deal through Enigma. Mm -hmm. So he gave me my master's back. But during the meeting, he said he wanted to start his label back up and that he'd still like to put it out. And I said, well, go ahead. Like, I gave him the go ahead. I'm like, why not? You know, I'd love to, to see it, see the light of day. Right. Absolutely. So that's something currently that's out, coming out in two weeks. And, and what's the name of that again? And it's coming out uh, on Record called, Store Day. It's, yeah, it's called Beyond the Shadow of a Doubt by Nerdy B and Shelly Chell with Incredible. Wow. So that's one of your newest projects that, that's coming out. Right. It's old, but it's new. I mean, it's really released for the first time. Wow. Wow. That's incredible. Um, I also have a, an app, a phone app, and that's um, nerve.fm slash Supreme LaRock. And that's where I do all my, put all my DJ mixes. I have demos. I have like unreleased stuff, uh, some old school rap battles, obscure stuff. You're probably not going to hear anywhere else. Wow. And, and that's, that's, that's on all, all platforms. That's the app. It's, it's in all stores, right? iPhone, Android, everything, yeah. right? Yes, exactly. So what's the name of the app one more time? It's nerve.fm slash supreme rock. 
Got you. Got you. So, uh, so that's dope, man. You know, congratulations on that. So, so, uh, Supreme, what, what do you want? What would you like to see your takeaway for your legacy for people to know about Supreme the Rock? That I kept it true school, you know, 100 of the culture. I appreciate this culture. I love it like no other. You know, I ride for it the way you ride for it. Just know that, you know, I kept the 100 with this. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, uh, I mean, you, you live and breathe it, right? You're hip hop. I mean, of course, exactly. I mean, you're DJ, your name is Supreme LaRock. And, you know, every day you can look at those Instagram posts and the social media and everything you're doing. And, you know, it's, it's hip hop. And of course, you know, once you get back to being able to tour the world, like you were before, you're going to be rocking them jams again too, right? Of course. I can't wait for that. So, so it's sub- funny because I just got uh, I just got hired at the radio station out here, like literally yesterday. Oh wow! So what's so what's that? What what's in the future for that? Well, I'm doing a I'm doing a uh, soul show every week. Gotcha. But I feel good because I feel like oh I'm gonna be playing again. You know, and people are gonna get to hear me. So I'm working again, basically. Right, right. Wow, that's incredible. That's incredible. So we'll have to, you know, stay tuned to that. I'm sure you're going to, you know, keep people posted on your, you know, your your social media and everything about that, right? Sure, for sure. So, so Supreme LaRock, before we get out of here, is there one, can you give me one memorable story from your history that people might not know? Anything, good, bad, you know, just something incredible from Supreme LaRock's history that happened, a memorable moment in your DJ life? Okay, I mean, here's one of them. I mean, there's a few. Nothing really comes to mind immediately, but so um, DJ Shadow's introducing album cover. I was there digging with Shadow and Benny B and Tom and uh, XL. I'm not in the picture. I'm not on the cover, but I was there. (laughs) I was digging with them guys. Wow. And it's, it's funny because it's it's gone on to be such an iconic cover or iconic picture. Absolutely, absolutely. That you know that that cover has become iconic, and it's just one of those pictures that you always see on the internet, DJ related, right? Right, of course. So, Supreme the Rock, how can our listeners continue to follow you? Uh, hit me up on my Instagram at Supreme the Rock. It's actually Supreme the Rock across the board on all platforms. Absolutely. So you got. A record coming out for Record Store Day. You have an app that people can go to now and download. And on the app, you have everything from exclusives, pictures, old school, you know, uh, memorabilia, um, new mixes, records that weren't released, just everything Supreme La Rock, right? Yes, sir. Listen, man, I want to thank you for allowing me to interview you for Vinyl Esquire. This is the DJ podcast that uplifts the DJ culture and honors our legends. And you're definitely a legendary DJ, an iconic figure from Seattle, Washington, uh, along with a lot of the other historical DJs and, you know, historical entities from Seattle. And you're definitely a part of that foundation. And you definitely represent the DJ culture to the fullest. So I want to thank you for allowing me to interview you and peel back the layers of your vast life. And uh, you keep collecting and keep digging because it's definitely hip hop and you got a lot of dope shit. You know what I mean? Thank you. Salute. Absolutely. And this is Vinyl Esquire, the DJ podcast. My name is DJ Rip and you are now listening to Supreme La Rock. Hello world. I want to welcome you to Vinyl Esquire. The podcast that delivers culture, true music. We're about to call get in with the funky fresh drummer CMT. It's all about being high powered, funky fresh hip hop, high powered hip hop. Perpetrated MCs, let's 